Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts. We're your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Karen Rhodes, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you so much for having me, John. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Atlanta area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about seven critical leadership execution tactics of the world's most successful leaders. Uh, There's a lot out there on leadership. And I'm a big believer in the mindset of leadership and like doing the inner work of leadership. But there are also specific strategies and techniques and tactics that leaders can and should use as well, in addition to mindset, in addition to inner work, uh, that will help them to be more effective. So we're going to unpack that and explore that a little bit together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Karen's bio with everybody. Karen Rhodes is an organizational strategist who is obsessed with up-leveling leadership capability and optimizing workforces to do their best work. After years of witnessing the dark side, chaos, and trauma caused by bad leadership within organizations, she ditched her comfy job as a corporate HR exec at Microsoft to commission a research study to uncover the critical success factors of over 10,000 high-performing leaders. I could go on from there, but I'm going to pause. Anything you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Yeah, you hit it spot on. I'll just say I was one of those individuals that could never be put in a box, if you will. So I was Mm. always curious and wanting to know more than what you can find on Google about leadership. So, uh, and I can tell you the story as we get into our conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. And I would love to hear just even just a little bit about this this research study that you commissioned uh, that really helped to launch a lot of what you're doing today. Absolutely, John. And thank you for allowing me to share with your audience listeners. Well, first of all, um, I've always had a passion about exemplary leadership throughout my entire career, although I've done a, a variety of roles in what I'll say the the HR people side of business, um, but leadership was always on the top of interest. And um, fast forward into my career, the longest stint I had in corporate was 14 years at the Microsoft Corporation, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, had a lot of opportunities there, um, but one of the ones that I was tapped on to assist with, and this will tell you my age, but this is back when um Kevin Turner was chief operating officer. Uh, They were desiring um, a global high potential leadership program there. Mm. And so I helped to lead and establish and create one for Microsoft back when high potential was such a buzzword. Fast forward, we we had over, gosh, 5,000 individuals, which is the top 3% of the organization in the leadership development program, but we collaborated with other companies around the world who were also specializing in their high potential leaders. And what we found through a lot of think tanks and research, which I won't bore you about, but what we found that companies did really great on teaching individual leadership skills and competencies, but left individuals hanging when it was time for execution. So when people Mm -hmm. hit roadblocks or stumbling blocks, they kind of twisted in the wind a little bit. So uh, when I founded my firm, I was curious as to the reasons why. And so that's when uh, me and my team um, commissioned the research study uh, with organizations across the globe. And fortunately, I had a huge network of being able to pull from the Microsoft name. And uh, we actually studied what I call the last mile of leadership, which is leadership in action or leadership execution. And we wanted to understand One key fact. So what were the things that differentiated those who were more successful leaders from those who weren't, even though they probably had equal levels of IQ and acumen and, you know, and you can imagine. So that's what we were trying to figure out. And that's uh, what uh, we wrote the book about our findings uh, of the research study. Yeah, well, that's excellent. And like I said in the introduction, uh, I think it's really important to get beyond 
you know, the, the theoretical around leadership, the, the, the abstract, which is important. Mm -hmm. Like mindset is really important. Yeah. The inner yeah. work is really important. All of that's super important. I don't want to diminish that uh, or be dismissive of that work because it's super important, but where the rubber you gotta meets deliver. the road, <laughs> you got to deliver and where the rubber meets the road, you know, that's where the experience happens for leaders as well as members of their team. So there are, are some very practical things that you can and should be doing day in, day out in on a consistent basis to ensure, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're being more successful as a leader beyond what your intention is, beyond what kind of is going on in your head. Um, so let's go ahead and start to dive in to those seven critical leadership execution tactics yeah. um, that I know in part came out of this research and through the work that you've been doing. Absolutely. And a slight disclaimer, and I can go through them really fast and we can talk about any one you want to go in depth, yeah. depth about, but a little disclaimer, um, there were a ton of uh, findings that came out of the research. But the reason why we focus on these seven is because these seven were universal, no matter your career mm -hmm. stage, what you were doing, um, your profession, or what have you. And since it touched everyone, we thought, wow, if we could at least get this out to individuals and get them upskilled in this area, then mm -hmm. boy, we thought what a great impact we could make. And then all seven are as equally important. One's not more important than the other. It's just that you might use this approach or tactic at different times based on the leadership efforts that you're you know, involved in. So let me run through them real quick for you. The first one um, tactic was leading. We found that successful leaders led with what we call intellectual horsepower. And mm -hmm. intellectual horsepower is all about using your area of expertise to kind of peek around corners and see opportunities that others miss and bring that back to the organization. So that was the first one. The second one was leading with courageous agility. And leading with courageous agility is all about having the courage and the fortitude to stand up for what you believe in and strive to move forward, even if the future is uncertain or unclear. So this is having the courage to go forth, even if you don't have all the answers to your questions and the effort that you're trying to lead. The third one was leading with um, a drive for results. It's kind of what it is. It's not a no-brainer, but it's being very tenacious about making sure the end goal is achieved, even if you have to pivot along the way. The fourth is leading with executive presence. And the way we defined it is about the ability to create very convincing either oral or written um, positions or arguments, if you will, in order to influence others to follow your lead. So giving them enough information to answer the questions in their head, to get them engaged and excited about following um, the lead that you're trying to do. The, um, I think we're on five, the fifth is leading with strategic decision-making. Once again, not a, a rocket science, but it's all about making good decisions yourself as a leader and leading a good decision-making process with your teams and stakeholders. Um, the sixth is uh, leading with intrapreneurship. It's a sister to uh, entrepreneurship, as you know, but entrepreneurship is all about having a focus on proving, uh, improving product services processes uh, within the entity or organization that you're working in, whether it's corporate or your own business or what have you. And then the last one is leading with stakeholder savvy, which is very similar to emotional intelligence, what we all know about, but um, Leading with stakeholder savvy is the ability to uh, really show up and relate to people in different situations um, and being able to influence them based on the social environments that you're in. So for a quick example, if you are an account rep, a sales account rep, you might have one approach that you interact with individuals during a meet and greet or networking. And then you might have another approach when you're trying to close a billion dollar deal. So, you know, just having that savvy to switch and relate as needed based on your environmental conditions. And so those were the, the seven universal tactics. And what uh, we teach in our programs and workshops are no matter what you're leading, either, either you're an individual leader or a leader of people or you're leading a business, 
Um, based on what you're trying to lead, we help uh, you look at the different angles of what you're leading with these seven, making sure that you're thinking through it appropriately, addressing it appropriately, and, and no blind spots um, are going to sink your effort. So that's what we try to do. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, I think there, there's a whole lot there. And I, I was having thoughts as you were going along. So what I would love to do is just kind of slowly go back through them. Okay. Uh, some of them we can go back through faster than others, probably. Sure. Um, but if we can start with the first one, uh, remind me what that one was. Uh, leading with intellectual horsepower. Horsepower. So you're, that's right. Yeah. I loved <laughs> I loved how you framed that. Uh -huh. The intellectual horsepower. Um, I think the cognitive bandwidth issue is of incredible importance for the modern day leader. Uh, it's, you know, we're not, I, there, there are leaders who lead teams and factories and production facilities and stuff like that. Um, but even those are way more sophisticated than they used to be, you know, even dec just a few short decades ago. And the vast majority of managers and leaders and supervisors, they're leading teams in a much more dynamic uh, environment that requires a lot of just intellectual horsepower, as you say, the, the ability, the, the intellectual bandwidth, like to just be able to handle a lot of stuff. And that's hard. I mean, you, you can't, on the one hand, people have their IQ and they have what they have, you know, like they, they have the capabilities that they have. But I've also found, you know, not only for myself, but for others I've worked with, that there are things you can do to actually increase that horsepower. Um, so maybe we could talk about that for just a minute, because, you know, on the one hand, people might say, oh, well, you know, I guess I'm out of luck because maybe they don't consider themselves to be the smartest person in the room. Um, it's not, it's not necessarily about being the smartest person in the room or the highest IQ. Um, th there's a difference, I think, between this, this intellectual horsepower and, and, uh, being the smartest person in the room. Can you describe that a little bit more for us? Absolutely. So it's kind of. I think this is what Malcolm Gladwell was getting when he was talking about the 10,000 hours mm. um, of, um, of dedication to an area. You're right. You don't have to be a rocket science, but we all have areas of expertise that we know a bit more about than others. Right. And then you're you're using that and you, then you're taking in inputs and information from all of the you know world and other people and what have you. And just thinking through, wow, what trends am I seeing? How can I use this in the working environment that I'm in? Who cares? Who can I share with this with? And um, how can I make an impact even greater than I'm making all by myself? So kind of thinking through um, all of these questions can help you bring up um, new ideas that you know, you're, if you're in corporate, your executive leaders are interested in, if you own your own business, something that your clients and market might be more curious and interested in that your competitors and peers may not have even thought about, but because you put a little bit of brain power and intellectual horsepower in there, you know, you'll see them as a genius sometimes to them when it just was setting a little bit of time aside to kind of think through, um, opportunities that, you know, are not as commonplace as yeah. others. And, and so many people are, they spend so much time jumping from thing to thing, putting out yeah. fires that they don't take the time to actually step back, to carefully think through, to do a little bit of research, to better understand before they start firing off ideas. That's and, right. you know, one, one way, a surefire way to just at least come across as one of the smarter people in the room. It's to simply do your homework and to know what you're talking about, you know, because right. there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot of people that share a lot of opinions that don't know what they're talking about. And they Absolutely. may be really smart uh, yeah. and, and people may be drawn to them and people may be inclined to believe them, but eventually it catches up to you if you're saying things that are nonsense um, or yes. things that aren't well-researched or thought through. So I think that's one key point. I really appreciate that. Another mm -hmm. thing to keep in mind too is, you know, there's these studies out of Harvard, MIT, some other places that talk about your cognitive bandwidth and like the amount of time the average person can spend on deep intellectual, cognitively heavy work every day. And and really they suggest it's it's only a couple hours, um, if you that. Know, yeah, yeah, if that. So, <laughs> so I guess my point is, 
be protective of your time and carve out time where you can do that deep work. Uh, a lot of people don't carve out that time or they spend too much time doing that kind of work and there's diminishing returns. Like you just, you, you, we're, we're not built to spend 10 hours a day doing that kind of deep cognitive work. And, yeah. and you're going to start to see there's going to be gaps and there's going to be, um, you're going to miss stuff and then, you know, you're going to erode your own credibility. So, so delegating appropriately, carving out time so you can spend, you know, that amount of time doing that deep work and then in preparation for important meetings and such, that's going to go a really long way to increase your intellectual horsepower and the bandwidth that you have. Yes. And John, uh, that you said it absolutely fabulously, but then I would also say, take it one step further. This pulls in your executive presence a little bit, those skills. But once you think through that, you'll need to um, compile your thoughts into what a, a sound bite, because yeah. the adult attention span, as you've mentioned, is very short. But what is key in leading others is differentiating what you're bringing to the table from all the other noise that is out there. We all have inputs coming at us, you know, a million miles a minute. But you have to make sure that you boil. You can't have five hours to explain what you're talking about. You've got to boil it down in a way that the people or the audience that you're talking to, that they will care about it and want to stop what they're doing, at least for a moment, to consider it and to help you, you know, um, carry out whatever it is you're proposing. So think, carve out the time, like John says, but then also boil it down to a soundbite to earn the right to be heard and explain more. Yeah. Yeah. And just because you're in the room with the person uh, or the, these key decision makers, whether it's around a boardroom table or even virtually you're on a zoom call in a zoom meeting, just because you're sharing the space with that person or those people doesn't mean they're paying attention to you. Um, yeah. And yeah. we, I mean, it's, it's kind of the norm now. I, I know that these norms do differ across companies, but it's, it's pretty typical that most people in most meetings are sitting there with their laptops they're kind of paying attention with one ear and they're working while they're in meetings because they're in so many meetings and they have to do their work sometime, right? Mm -hmm. And so if that's the reality in your organization, you better have a really good pitch for whatever you're saying to get catch their attention, get them to right. perk up so that they'll like lift their head from their laptop, set that email aside for a minute and pay attention to what you're actually saying. Because exactly. you may have the most brilliant idea in the world uh, that's going to help you know, the organization in whatever way. And, it, but if you don't get those key decision makers to actually pay attention, then it you know, it's like the tree falling in a forest when no one's there to, to witness it. Right. D That's does it actually right. make a noise? So. <laughs> You're absolutely right, John. Definitely. <laughs> I know I wrote about in my book really quick. Um, one example, if I can share one, and this was kind of a combination of intellectual horsepower and entrepreneurship where you're improving product services processes or what have you. But I wrote about in the uh, book where there were some students who um, were trying to help or bring um, medical uh, assistance to third world countries. And they were thinking through how to do that in an economical way. And they ended up using a salad spinner, which is one mm -hmm. of those salad spinners to dry out lettuce. Mm -hmm. They used a salad spinner, um, I believe it's some straws, and um, a couple of things under $2 that you can find at a Home Depot. And they were able to build um, a machine that would be able to act as um, almost like a medical lab. You know, when they diffuse blood to look at it and, and analyze it, it had enough revolutions to be able to bring that to. Um, mm -hmm. third world countries. And for less than $5 total, um, they saved a ton of money, um, you know, and, and opened up access uh, mm -hmm. to that. So that's an example of someone using a combination of a lot of those tactics to um, bring a groundbreaking idea to reality that helps literally millions, you know, around the world. So yeah, 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 excellent. <laughs> and, and there were so many other really great points you made there. You talked about essentially emotional intelligence, 
Uh, you talked about agility, exactly. um, the ability to pivot rapidly. We we need people who, in, in this modern volatile environment, you know, where yeah. things are constantly disrupted, where where um, you know there's hyper competition on a global scale, we need people who are able to not only kind of run the day to day, keep the trains running on time, so to speak. Uh, but but can actually connect in real human ways with their people because it's the people on our teams that actually do the work that get the stuff done that provide the products and services. We need people who are are more strategically agile who can who can look around the corners a little bit but also then pivot and and move in different directions as needed and not wait until catastrophe to to start to move in a different direction. Um, all of this, you know, it, it may sound super difficult, but in, in my experience, it comes down to some some very basic things that if you just do consistently over time, um, you know, a little bit every day, every week, then you will develop more of these skills. You'll be able to it's like it's like exercising a muscle. You you will right. develop the muscle and you will be it will become more natural to you and you will be more effective in the implementation of your leadership strategy, in Absolutely. the execution of your leadership strategy, and in terms of actually getting stuff done. So not just yeah. your intentions, but actually performance and actually getting stuff done. And that's what we all need. And it starts with actually seeing your people, being mindful and present with your people, treating them with dignity and respect developing yeah. trust with your team, um, and then seeking open and transparent communication on an ongoing basis. As you do that, you start to create, or at least you create the foundation where you can have a more dynamic environment of continual learning. A continual learning organization is one that also is fostering, you know, this, this um, challenging, the, the willingness to try stuff, challenge the status quo, iterate and, and experiment you know, and if you do that, then you create cool stuff and, and you kind of unlock a lot of hidden potential oftentimes that people have because they're too scared to share. They're, they're that's worried right. about if it's going to make them look dumb or that it's, you know, they're, they're going to try something that's not going to be completely successful, quote unquote successful. And, and it's going to hurt their opportunities for advancement or promotion, or, or maybe they might even lose their job. So creating that psychologically safe environment with your people is, it just it's takes some, key. some simple, simple commitment, um, a little bit of each and every day to do that, right? And once you do that, then they'll open the doors to a lot of the tactics that I just talked about because yeah, you absolutely. know, like trust factor will skyrocket and they'll be more willing to share with you um, their thoughts and perspectives and you all together can decide the best course of action forward. But it's, um, as I mentioned, earning the right to be heard and having that conversation yeah. That's what you have to do as a leader. And then the rest is what I call in the South gravy. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> right. Awesome. Karen, yeah. this has just been a really great conversation. I know at the time oh. I need to let you go. But before we wrap up, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Absolutely. Thank you, John, for this opportunity. Well, you can... Um, Find me personally on social media, um, LinkedIn, X, and Instagram is kind of where we thrive. Um, our sh website is called shockinglydifferent.com, shockinglydifferent.com. I wanted to make sure you got that. Um, and we do help what we call the people side of business. That's what we work with um, corporations. Um, to help them expand their people initiatives. And we have a team of over 350 consultants of different specialties to help them to do that. We also have our signature leadership program, which came out of this research. So please check that out. And then this one final thought that I want to leave with your audience is everything we talked about day today, John, is not brain surgery. Yeah. Um, so it's easier to understand, but you have to put it into practice, as you say. And the one thing I'll ask your audience uh, listeners is each one of you are just one move away from greatness. So I'm just curious, what is going to be your next move? Think about that and then go forth and make the impact that you want to make in the world. 
I love it. Karen, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Karen and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.